Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of The Bright Side of Life. I am your host, Melissa Bright, and today we are here with Dr. Gabby. That is Gabrielle Polici. She is has her PhD and is a professor and a coach guiding individuals and groups towards wholeness using writing as medicine. She recently just came out with her very first book called All This Healing Is Killing Me, and we are going to be <laughs> discussing her backstory to her book, um, and just all the wonderfulness that she has accomplished and basically doing this to, to heal herself and to help others heal through all of these wonderful, you know, different modalities that she has learned. Um, so we are going to talk about all of that. And also I realized today, I kind of wanted to do something different. I could have read your whole bio, but I feel like sometimes people check out after like the third sentence. So for everybody, the bio, her bio will be in the show notes so you can see everything she has accomplished so much. And she is like literally a badass. So go and go and read it all. But you're also going to hear <laughs> her story right here. So Dr. Gabby, how are you doing today? Hi, this is so fun. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> you are welcome. So I literally had you on my podcast when your publicist emailed me and she was talking about your book and she's like, the title is all this healing is killing me, you know, and she's like, would you like to have her on? And I'm like, yes, because I resonate so much with that title. Yes, yes, yes. So I guess to kind of start it off, we know you have written a book and we will get to that, but how, what is your story? What's your backstory? How did you come to even to, to write this book so people can kind of get to know who you are better? <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. I hear that comment very frequently about the title of the book. <laughs> it is really resonating and it's been a surprising experience to hear how much resonance there is in the title. And then when I start to talk about the content, people kind of drop into their own experience and start to share some of their stories with me, I realize how common it is to have a story of healing from trauma, a journey of recovery, have this experience of enduring a lot of different modalities and feeling like, wow, this is really a grind, like trying to get better, whether it's trying to fix your marriage or trying to overcome addiction or trying to clean up your mental health, like whatever it is, mm -hmm. I do feel like I'm, I feel more sense of belonging having published the book than I did before because of everybody sharing the resonance. Uh, and my journey is one of a lot of hard work when it comes to healing. I've been on a healing journey for most of my life because I had a lot of childhood trauma, which I write about in the book, domestic violence, mental illness, addiction, all of the things. And I had to find all the tools and all the resources and all the support to get through that. And the reason I say that I think that writing is medicine is because until the moment that I had really told the story to myself and to, to other people, I wasn't really owning it until I was really owning it. I wasn't really accepting it until I wasn't accepting it. I couldn't really be in my own power and my own wholeness. And I couldn't have the serenity and the joy that I have now, because I think we have this very lopsided idea about being human, that the goal is to kind of continue to shed anything negative or uncomfortable or sad or angry and to just kind of move further and further into brightness to use your <laughs> name of your podcast. Um, and I don't think that that's the goal at all. I think the goal is to hold all of it in compassion and kindness. And I think when you're holding all of it, then you're really showing up as who you are. And I think there's a tremendous amount of freedom in that because you can just actually be who you are. And and even we hear like a lot of lip service, I think, in social media around authenticity and be authentic. And and I don't even think that the kind of marketing version of authenticity is really authenticity. I think authenticity really is sharing all the things that you like and you don't like and, and the things that you're proud of and the things that you regret. 
And I said in one of the interviews, I put everything in the book that I don't want you to know about me. (laughs) (laughs) And there's like a real liberation in that. Like, you're going to read this and you're going to like me or not. And that's okay. Uh, But it allows me to just let all that go. And like, what a relief it is to just let all that go, you know? Yeah. So something that you, you said earlier that like struck me, you said, before you wrote this book, you had not yet like told yourself this story. And it's, I'm just like, yes, absolutely. Because so often, I don't know, like we talk, I, for the last two years have done nothing but talk about my trauma from losing my mom to losing my dad to childhood trauma to everything. But there still is a sense of like ownership throughout the healing process that like still happens. Like we can talk about it just nonchalantly, but then sometimes it'll still smack you in the face of like shame or something. And it's like, well, Melissa, cause you're still like not accepting that part of, of your story and you're not free from this yet. And I'm still, as we know, the whole healing process is a journey. It, it's, it's just continuing, but, um, your, your book had to have completely freed you because there probably was, I don't, I don't want to say, it, but like shame still like holding. And now it's like, well, now it's all out there. Like I have put everything, there's nothing left for me to hide from myself or the world. So you that that's just, I think it's awesome. You know? Yeah. Um, what? Yeah, there was earlier versions of the book that were not so honest. There was earlier versions of the book. Like I started the first draft in 2007 and then there was another draft in 2013. And then I did another draft during the pandemic. And like with each iteration, I, I got more honest because in my life I was getting more honest. You know, I started oh out God. as just like a representation of myself and a persona. And as I got more honest, the book got more honest until the point where I was like, I'm going all in on honesty. I'm just going all in. And I just went all in. And I had a few people that I was sending excerpts to, and they had a really good radar for honesty. And they would come back to me if it was 98% honest, they'd come back to me and they'd be like, no, it's not completely honest. I would be like, F you. (laughs) Why why are you pushing? But like, that's like, when you have real people in your life that are really honest, that's like, the blessing, right? That they're like, no. So this version is my whole truth, right? It might not be the truth of the other characters in the story who represent family and friends and things, but it's my whole Mm. truth that's in the, that's in the book. And what that did was it really put me on the line in full and total exposure, right? Full vulnerability, like a massive amount of vulnerability. And, and then the real healing for me happened when everyone started reading the book. It's only been out for about six weeks or so. When when everyone started reading the books and I just was flooded with love and appreciation and people telling me they're so proud of me. And that was like completely life-changing for me because I had uh, catastrophic expectations. I thought radical honesty and radical vulnerability is going to be a terrible thing. Like people are going to be like, that girl's crazy. (laughs) Like stay away from that girl. Or I don't want that girl teaching me anything. So I'm a professor. I don't want that girl working at my company. Like I didn't know what Mm. people were going to say. And none of that is true. My employers are so proud of me my friends and family are so proud of me and it's really astonishing it, it's just it's like a miracle outcome that I, I was not and I'm not saying that that's going to happen for everybody like your story might piss people off your story might upset people you're so I mean you never know like you're taking a big risk when you share your story but for me it was a risk worth taking and one that has been incredibly positive in in outcome Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Do you feel like there had to have been a hope that this would be the outcome? Because you said like, I didn't know that radical vulnerability and honesty was going to be the key, but here it was. And, you know, obviously you had people telling you like, you have to get honest. For me, that is where 
like vulnerability set me free in 2020 per se. Of course, there's layers as we all know. But when I started my podcast is literally the same week I started therapy, like the healing journey has been with my podcast. And then I told myself when I started my podcast, I was going to start showing up as the real Melissa on social media. There was no more, you know, um, like fake stuff. If I was struggling today, you were going to know about it. Uh, if I didn't want to clean my house and have friends over or have friends over and not want to clean my house, I was going to share these little experiences that just fester with us because of this, um, lack of self-worth or not feeling good enough or having to keep up with the Joneses. Mm -hmm. And with me sharing my vulnerabilities, I got messages from the most random people that I would have ever have thought resonated with me opening up. Like, my biggest example is usually older, like an older man being like, thank you for sharing your story because I carry a lot of shame around this, that, and the other. And so now I always say that vulnerability is my superpower because it allows like you sharing your story gives so many people permission to own those parts of themselves that they see in your story. Yeah. And it's just beautiful. Amen. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I mean, there. As I said, it's still a journey and it's still like, there's still things, you know, like that I haven't talked about yet, but I, I'm like, okay, we can't just like totally uncover the lid in just like one, one thing. Unless and you're me. <laughs> well, well, yes, exactly. And I have considered writing a book and I'm like, is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? So I guess I didn't realize that there were three revisions. So another reason why I well, wanted to, or, revisions. Okay. There was like, it was a 15 year writing process, Holy shit. <laughs> which okay. doesn't mean it's going to be like that for anybody. It was just that I, it, that's how long it took me to really be honest. And like, if I had published a book 10 years ago, you would have been bored. It was boring. The writing was boring. Right. Exactly. And okay. So another reason why I wanted to have you on my podcast is I also do know that you, um, had lost your mom in, in your twenties. And so we mm -hmm. share that similarity. Um, so in 2007, which is when you first decided to start writing the book, how long had she been gone? Well, she died in 1996. So it had okay. already been a while. And what I had done is I had focused all of my physical, mental, emotional, spiritual energy into getting a PhD. So from the time that she died, I was like midway through college until I was 32 years old, I was solely focused on academics and getting my PhD. And I did my dissertation about women healers. So I interviewed women healers for different, from different cultures and countries all over the world who are practicing various forms of medicine, like Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, energy medicine, indigenous medicine. And that's where I just, I like poured all my energy into that. And that, and I graduated with a PhD in 2006. And so in 2007, I woke up and I was like, what now? And then I was like, I need to tell my story. You know, I've told the story of all these women. I hold uh, women in reverence, you know, especially when they're practicing these sacred arts. And I was just mm -hmm. so fascinated. And they told me about their different experiences, whether it was like breast cancer or failed relationships, whatever that informed their work as a healer and how you can only take people places that you've gone you have to heal the things within yourself to support other people to heal them they had told me all these things and I thought it's my turn it's my turn to tell my wow. story I should tell my story and I wrote the first version of my story and it was crap it was just it was just <laughs> crap and I was like man why is this so terrible but you don't know why something's terrible until you know why it's terrible so I put it away and then I took mm -hmm. it back out in 2013 when I had a little break, I had been teaching full time, I'd been working full time, and I got a little bit of a break and I took it back out and I did another version. And this time I got the courage to send it to an editor who read it and said, This is terrible. And I was like, Oh, just oh, as God. I suspected. <laughs> so then I put it away again and I took it back out in 2019. And that time I was like, I'm not. And meanwhile, I was like taking writing classes and, mm. and, you know, reading books about writing and, and reading, I've must, I've must have read 2000 memoirs. I mean, I've read every memoir that, pro, pro, you know, oh published in English, God. like I'm obsessed with memoir. Oh so meanwhile, I was like trying to figure out 
and analyze like what makes a good memoir? What makes a memoir meaningful and compelling? And because it's written like fiction, memoirs written like fiction, and I'm not okay. an inherently natural fiction writer. I, you know, I have a PhD, so I write research, I write yeah. academically. And when you write memoir, you write in story, it's story and it's written like fiction and it reads like fiction. It doesn't read like self-help. It doesn't read like that. So I had been studying and studying and studying. So then when I did the version in 2019, 2019, I gave it to some friends and they were like, you nailed it. You nailed it. This is great. And so I went through, uh, I hired some additional editors. I hired two or three additional editors and did revisions between 2019 and 2021 to kind of make it, um, just what it is now like all the the story structure and the copy editing and and everything um so it was a very very long journey very worthwhile I yeah it, even if it had taken 50 years it still would have been worthwhile right well that's what I was gonna ask like looking back on it now okay I guess my question is did you trust the process like in tw in 2007 when you're like this sucks did you think like okay, I'm just going to put it away and I'm just going to do this in a couple years? Or did you think like, I don't know that I'll ever write a book? Or did you trust the process of it will happen when I'm ready? It will happen when, what was that like for you? D it does that a, make sense? <laughs> it was a burning desire. I, okay. I didn't want to die with a book in me. It was a burning mm. desire. It was very significant to me. It was very important to me that at some point I write a, I write a book but it was also equally important that it was a good book. Like that when I listened to it, cause I also did the audio recording. And when I listened to the audio recording, I'm moved to tears, even though it's my story and I've written it a thousand <laughs> times, the book had to be good. And I needed to figure out how to make that happen. And I'm like a dog with a bone. I mean, I spent 15 years pursuing a PhD. Like I don't give up on things easily. I do like I am relentless and I was just determined to write something beautiful. So I was yeah. never not going to do it. Right. Oh, I love that. And I have not read your book yet. I do have a copy of it, but I do want to, um, I have, I've had a lot of books being You'll sent get to me, to when you get so to it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I definitely do. Um, I had a question that I wanted to ask you. Okay. So when you were doing your PhD, were you and doing all these, um, cause you did stories on, um, healing medicine and things like that. And you yourself was going on your own healing journey. Can I ask you, like, I guess I didn't become aware of like that. I had trauma until like 2020. Like I knew that I had quote unquote daddy issues and stuff that he wasn't in my life. And he was right. like really hard on me but until I really started learning all this stuff. So were you aware, like I I've lost my mom. I've been through this stuff. I know that I need to go on a healing journey or is it just by chance that this, your PhD is kind of entangled in all of this also, or did you do it to heal? Well, my father was a neurologist and a psychiatrist. So we had a medical family Okay. And my, my parents got divorced when I was young and my parents took me to therapy for that. There was always therapeutic stuff happening. My dad was a psychiatrist. Mm. Like, so okay. we were just a family of therapy and I knew pretty early on, maybe when I was like eight, like none of this is right. And I'm going to be really messed up. <laughs> like I knew, like I knew from the very beginning, I also thought I could manage it just by getting straight A's and I thought I could overcome and push through. I ended up going back to therapy when I was in college right after my mom died because it was unmanageable. Mm -hmm. And when I went back to therapy when I was 18 or 19 or whatever, I, I also knew I'm really messed up. And I still thought like, but I can power through this. Like therapy always seemed to me, I just thought, oh, it's not going to work. Like I, I, I couldn't really embrace the process. Uh, and so I just kind of veered off into all the holistic things because the holistic things made me feel empowered. Like if I was doing yoga, if I was doing meditation, if I was doing breath work, but I really, I felt a sense of empowerment and 
talking felt a bit too passive to me. Like I was never really going to get to the thing and I wasn't going to get it out of my body because trauma always felt very kinesthetic to me and very somatic. It always felt like it was inside of me and I, I'd rather have surgery, right, than have psychotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was always part of my life. It was I always knew that it was yeah, important and knew that I had to be doing something and my symptoms were always really severe. I I had very severe panic attacks from the time I was 10 and mm. then I had a lot of physical manifestations of illness with I, which I write about in the book like I, everything from migraines to ovarian cysts like I there was always manifestations of trauma in my body and I didn't know the mind body connection until I was in my late 20s early 30s so that was a big part of the learning process that okay. if you feel bad your body will manifest something physical right. if you don't deal yeah. with it on an emotional level so that right. was part of the learning process and that was super helpful but yeah I always knew and I always did the work okay and then if if I were to ask you now and I don't want this to be an obvious question because you've you've said some stuff but if you had to pick I'm going to challenge you do it <laughs> <laughs> You get, you get two healing tools. They can be medicine. They can be practices. They can be holistic, whatever. What, what are you choosing to heal your, heal your trauma? And then why? A hundred percent nature. Nature Mm. is my biggest ally and my biggest healer. A hundred percent nature. When I say nature, it's everything from just being outside to having my hands in the dirt, to jumping in a cold river or a hot spring, to eating plants, to having tinctures, flower tinctures, to boiling ginger water and drinking. Like literally nature has everything. Nature has Mm. everything. The air, the sunshine, the water, the food, the plants, it has everything, everything. So that's for me essential. There's, there's no way that I could separate my healing journey or my physical or mental health from nature. If you just had me in a building all the time and you were taking me from one doctor to another, one practice to another, I would just be dying. Like nature is critical for me. Yeah. Uh, Beyond that, it's my relationship to myself because one of the things I learned along my journey is that We've been outsourcing a lot of this to people that we think have authority that know more than we do about our minds and our body. And all I need to do is talk to myself about what's going on. And myself will tell me what I need to do. And I have a very intimate relationship with myself. And I'll either write it down and read it back, or I'll do a voice note and I'll listen, or I'll find ways of listening. I'll quiet my mind and I'll sit in meditation. I'll ask myself questions or I'll talk out loud to myself while I'm walking somewhere. And I feel that that relationship is critical. I don't think chat GPT or, <laughs> or some <laughs> ER doctor, I just don't think any of them have the answers for me personally. And it's something that has just been true for me over and over again along the path. It doesn't mean that healers and doctors and medicine can't support me. Those things can be supportive and people can reflect back to me things that might be blind spots for me. And there have been junctures where I don't know what to do and I've gotten good advice or good practices or good tools from someone else. But at the end of the day, all healing is self-healing. And I believe that wholeheartedly. Oh my gosh. I just absolutely loved everything you said. To be honest, I was not expecting you to say those two things. And that's exactly why I did not want to assume. Like I thought you were going to say like, let's just throw like meditation or yoga or something. And I'm asking the question because everybody's healing journey has different recipes there is absolutely no one way to like go on your healing journey. Um, what you connect with, like your you wanting to be in nature, that could look totally different for somebody else's healing journey. And that's okay. And that's what I guess I want my listeners to take away to be like, if you don't want to get on a yoga mat, don't get on a yoga mat, go 
try something else. Not saying that yoga is not beneficial because I love it, but there are so many as you tools, exercises, modalities, everything. And I, I mean, I just love your, your two answers. I mean, nice. it was, that was, I was not and expecting you to say that. <laughs> I'll say something about the yoga mat. If you don't want to get on the yoga mat, you got to ask yourself why you don't want to get on the yoga mat. So part of having a relationship with yourself is having an inquiry and recognizing mm -hmm. when you're bumping up against something that is a block versus bumping up against something that's like a preference versus bumping up against something that's just outside your comfort zone. It's important to have these inquiries. Like I have a friend right now that's training for a big race and she's been doing mobility training because she's had some injuries and shoulders and knees in various places and it causes her some pain and she's done the chiropractic and she's done the the infrared sauna and the ice baths and whatever but it kept coming back that she had to do the mobility training and she just she hates it it's the most boring mm -hmm. tedious and she finally surrendered because she realized that the value was more important than her attitude about it. And it's the only thing that's really created consistent pain relief for her in her training. And th those kinds of inquiries are really important when you are choosing how to move forward, who to work with. You might have an intuition like, this healer isn't right for me. And that might be spot on. They, they mm -hmm. might not be right for you. But you have to be able to distinguish within yourself an intuition that's saying that this isn't the right direction for you versus your own resistance about doing something because you think it's boring or you are scared or does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, I absolutely love that because you, you do need to be brutally honest with yourself and right. exactly that it's, do I just don't want to be curious about yoga? Like me and my brother are so, we tell each other, go listen to the song, go watch this documentary, go do it. And like, we both sometimes will and won't. And like, it pisses me off because I'm like, Gary, this will change your life. Go like I have, I'm, I'm telling him to listen to like people I have on my podcast episode or my podcast. And I'm like, you don't understand. So I did a trick on him. He told me about a book that he read and I'm like, okay, I'm going to have him on my podcast. And I did. He's an attachment specialist, um, Adam Lane Smith. <laughs> so then my brother had to listen to the podcast episode and he was like, okay, yes. And he's learned a lot, but I'm saying, I'm saying all this because we want to help people like know why you should check these things out, whether it's yoga, whether it's journaling and not just write it off, no pun intended, like see if it works for you, why you like it, why you don't like it. I have been blessed, blessed to interview over 100, 200 people, so many of them in this field. And so I've got to hear all the good stuff of why yoga, why talk therapy, why hypnotherapy so much. And so I'm like, just get, I want to get curious of why that. And then I'm like, I want to go try that. What's the next thing I can go try? You know, that's so perfect. I love your yeah. point. I love your yes. point <laughs> for sure. Gary, you should listen to this episode, Gary, Gary, this episode is for you. <laughs> um, I've already told him about you today. <laughs> I've already told him about you today. Um, and I can't say why I told him. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you offline why I told him about you, but okay. we will talk a little bit about it. I just won't make it. I really like why. the name Gary too. I used to have a cat named Gary that I loved very much. So <laughs> that's funny. It's my, it's my mom and dad's dad or my mom and dad's my dad and my brother's name. Um, so yes. Okay. Now a couple of other questions I wanted to ask you because this was in the notes is that you had a spiritual experience at your mom's funeral. Correct. Can you talk a little bit about that? Would you mind sharing? I'm just yeah, curious like what that was. Yeah, it was very unexpected. I grew up very traditional Catholic upbringing, had to go to church, went to Catholic school, all that kind of stuff. And then when my mom passed away, I was at the funeral home before the wake and I went to the viewing to, to see her body. And my mom wasn't in her body. My mom was kind of floating around the body 
and I felt her talking to me and telling me like, I'm not there, I'm here. And I write about this in the book and she continued to communicate with me. And I had sort of a psychedelic experience of being able to see energy and, and she was moving in in and out of different aspects of nature when we were at the funeral and I didn't understand what it meant. And it was part of the reason I went back to therapy because I was like, clearly (laughs) something is very wrong (laughs) with my brain. Uh, But then I dove into the literature. One of the reasons I fell down the rabbit hole of literature about different medicine traditions and spiritual traditions is because medicine and spirituality used to be yin and yang for thousands and thousands of years before Western medicine separated them. And Western medicine is very young. Western medicine is like 200 years old. Indigenous medicine is 10,000 years old. It's just very, very old. And there's a concept of chi or Mm -hmm. prana or life force energy or, or, Mm -hmm. or different things like this in all of these kinds of medicine, as well as, I don't know if you've read Tibetan book of the dead, but there's all these rituals around the dead and and the different realms that they go to. And so there's a very rich history around our relationship with energy. And, and, and I, I just had this experience unexpectedly and then started to study more and more and more about it and realized that it wasn't that unusual. A lot of people have similar experiences. Definitely people who do psychedelic medicine have these experiences. And I, and I currently work in psychedelic medicine and it's 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 not that unusual and and i thought that was a disservice as well that people didn't know that having these experiences where you feel energetics of nature or people who have passed away or you feel connected to guides spiritual guides all of that stuff has been part of traditions for ages and so i write a lot about it in the book how i maintained a relationship with my mom after she passed for decades i maintained a relationship with her and i think we can have that i think there's cultures that they call on their ancestors and they maintain relationships with their ancestors as as just part of their regular lives and i think that that has a lot of value in this idea of stuff ending so abruptly and not having any of those connections anymore that doesn't resonate with me Mm -hmm. and it 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 hasn't been true to my own experience Mm. I love that and it's really for me I I haven't had an experience like you I I want to say that I wish I have like I've I've tried to call upon my mom one time (laughs) I actually want to share this story so when my mom passed away I had to move not because of her, but my lease was up around the same time that she had passed away. And I moved into an apartment, swear to God, the back window opened to a cemetery. And my stepdad had told me that he had felt my mom lay next to him, let's say a week before. He's like, I know it was her. I felt the bed. And I'm like, this is amazing. I want to see mom. So I'm like, okay, mom, I'm going to call this. I was, it was at nighttime. And I said, you know, if, if you're here, if you're around me, you know, just let me know how I know you're here. And like, all of a sudden I see this light coming in through my daughter's bedroom and I'm like, holy crap. Like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm really ready for this. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Like mom, I'm not sure. I was freaking out. Well, lo and behold, I go in there and I open the curtain and it's like somebody driving through the cemetery. I swear to God, this was like at 1030 at night. Like not a normal time that you should be driving in a cemetery. So unfortunately it was not my mom, but it like scared the crap out of me. <laughs> I, I thought it was her. It was not. But I love, I love the story that you tell. Um, I actually just had, I don't know if you know who she is. Do you know who Winnie uh, Chan Wang is? Okay. She does. Um, she's an acupuncturist and a Reiki healer and all this stuff. I just had her on my podcast last week and she was talking all about the chi. And I mean, I know a lot about it, but been learning more about it. Um, and I just think that experience would be amazing. Now, can I ask you, you said you had it for several years. How Mm -hmm. did it end? Like what made it end? Can I ask that? I don't think it's really over. Uh, The last time I had contact with my mom was during the pandemic. I, I felt her presence similar to your stepdad, like, oh, I feel like my mom is here. That's strange. 
And then I felt a message come through to me. She said to me that her brother was coming to stay with her. That was what the message was. And so when she passed, she left behind a brother and a sister who are now in their 70s. And and the way I interpreted it was, oh, that my uncle was going to pass. So she said that um, he was coming to stay with her in two months was the message. And so I called my aunt and I was like, how's our uncle bill doing and she's like oh i haven't talked to him in a while and i was like i think you should talk to him i think something might happen and sure enough she talked to him and he was diagnosed with cancer and two months later he passed so so i continue to have some very um infrequent communications with my mom it had been a long time since i had any kind of communication um like that but I think this is accessible to us. Like you Mm -hmm. said, you didn't know if you were ready. I I don't know that I was ever ready. Like, I don't (laughs) think you ever feel ready. I think for some reason, my relationship with my mom was just strong enough to kind of penetrate those barriers. It just sort of worked out that way. And I don't know why it worked out that way. And my dad passed 10 years ago and I, and I haven't really felt anything Mm. I talked to one psychic one time who said, your dad is here and he's making a big ruckus and he wants to talk to you. And I was like, okay. <laughs> like, So I don't know. I haven't had that kind of connection with him. So maybe it just depends on whatever kind of karmic bonds or, um, you know, contracts we have yeah. with, with loved ones. I'm not sure how it works. Yeah. And that's true because there has been like when my mom did pass away, um, she passed away in August and it was a beautiful hot as hell day here in St. Louis. And the, it wasn't the day of her funeral, but it was at, a couple days after she passed, there was a, a huge rainbow on the top of the hill, like looking from my dad's house. And it's, I mean, it's sunny as can be. And two rainbows happened that week that she passed with like just sun. And I'm like, so now rainbows have always meant something for me. So I guess in ways I didn't see a, an actual, like, being kind of like at your your mom's funeral but there has been those so like rainbows have always been significant to me you know it it keeps it helps me like even if I hear Led Zeppelin like my dad loved loved Led Zeppelin I I just tell myself like that has to be my dad because it helps me know like hey they're close because if it if I don't tell myself that I get really sad and remind myself of abandonment issues. <laughs> I think they are really close. I mean, that's been my experience is that there isn't much separation between us and then the energetic essence of everything. I right. do think they are really close. Yeah. I hope yeah. they are. I hope they are. Um, now you had said something about the psychedelic experience. And I also know that you, I'm not familiar with what third wave is. Um, but you have a passion for plant medicines and for psychedelic healing. So can you talk a little bit about the the topic of psychedelic healing? Because this might absolutely be foreign to some of my listeners. Um, and they might be really excited to hear about <laughs> psychedelic healing. <laughs> yeah, the company that I work for is called Third Wave. We are a platform that provides a lot of different kinds of education and training. So we publish articles and podcasts and we have a coaching certification program so you can learn how to coach other people who are using psychedelic medicine we have personalized psychedelic coaching if you want to have an experience where you're using the medicine and you want someone to support you we have mushroom grow kits if you want to cultivate mushrooms at home and 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 grow your own mushrooms we have a lot of different things happening at third wave it's super fun and i got into it kind of like I get into everything, which was accidentally the universe was just like, here, you're going to go in this direction. (laughs) During the pandemic, I was doing volunteer work. I I started out building some houses and then I started working on some farms and learning permaculture and herbalism. I just wanted to get more connected to nature. I, I really felt like my life had skewed too far in the direction of just spending all day, every day on the computer and it wasn't good for my physical or mental health. So I got back outside and I ended up meeting some medicine women living and studying with them. One of them was in New Mexico and I was working with peyote with her 
And then another one was in Guatemala and I was working with psilocybin with her and I started microdosing. Microdosing is when you take a non-intoxicating dose of a psychedelic substance. So uh, if you were going to trip on mushrooms, you'd take two or three grams. You can take up to 20 grams pretty safely. And these are a fraction of a gram, uh, a microdose. And when you take that, it's not intoxicating, but it still has impact on different systems of the body. So it can uplift your mood or make you a bit more creative or open your heart. Like there's different effects that they have. And so I was microdosing on peyote. I was microdosing on psilocybin. I was seeing how it made my body feel. And I really felt like it was the best alternative to an antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication. It felt very natural. It didn't make me feel weird or wonky or give me insomnia or affect my appetite. Like it didn't have any of those effects. It only just really enhanced my quality of life. So I did that for a while. And then I went a little bit deeper. I did two ayahuasca ceremonies and I did a ketamine protocol with a telemedicine company. And I really felt like these medicines were a real gift that we have been, you know, we've had them locked away in a box for 50 years because we had done a lot of research in the 50s and early 60s about the benefits of psychedelic medicine for depression, anxiety, addiction. We really had really strong evidence that, that these were good and then everything went downhill mm -hmm. and and we started the war on drugs and we said nobody can use any of the drugs and it became criminalized and also just the stigma in general of you know that it was going to make you crazy or it was going to make you sort of drop out of society or <laughs> I don't know there was a lot of propaganda and so I accidentally mm -hmm. got into psychedelic medicine and I fell in love with it and as someone who's been working in healthcare for my whole career, I've seen people getting progressively worse for my whole career, like more depression, more addiction, more overdoses, more suicide. Like I just think people are getting worse. And I think the statistics support that. And I think we need new solutions. And I feel like these medicines could be really viable solutions for a lot of people. And so I just sought out different companies. I found Third Wave at a conference called the Wonderland Conference in November, and I fell in love with the team. And I love the fact that they were education-based because I'm an educator. I'm a professor. Yeah. That's what I do. <laughs> I educate. That's what I do. And I just love that they were education-based. They want people to understand what all of the different substances are and how they affect you and how they should be used and how you integrate the experiences. And, and that's, and that's a real valuable offering. Um, so yeah, that's how I, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Accidentally, I love it. Like you said, the universe called you called you to do it. Now, okay. Do you have any work? Have you done any work um, related to cannabis? Not personally. It is okay. it is used for healing. And I, I have one of my graduate school um, friends. She's been uh, working with cannabis for years as a nurse. She actually, I think she just wrote a book about it. So it is a very valuable, it's a very valuable medicine for a lot of different conditions. Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. So I ask you about that because I have had a really, really couple really bad experiences with cannabis, um, which is extremely unfortunate. And one of my first stories is I've had it, like paranoia on it before, um, to the point where like, I thought my ex-boyfriend was gay and like just crazy stuff. Well, then one time, um, I had really bad anxiety and I had smoked a couple times that day. I was already doing it for about four months um, just at night. And all of a sudden I had a really bad thought that I was going to harm myself. And at that point, I won't lie. We did have a gun in the house and that really, really scared me. Like there was a thought that my body was so strong that I could go harm myself. And so I said never again, but then I had PTSD for two weeks after that. 
a really like my body just went numb thinking I was going to do that again. This, this thought would not stop. I'm like, why will this stop? This thought not leave my brain. Something is going to happen. Then I had to check myself into the hospital because this, I'm like, why do I keep having this thought? I've, I haven't felt like I've wanted, I've never been suicidal, but why is this thought keep entering my brain? So I had to go to the hospital. Um, I was told that that time by my therapist that it possibly was cannabis, cannabis induced psychosis. I've also read up that if you have a family history of mental illness, which I do, my mom was diagnosed bipolar, um, or, or schizophrenia. So long story short, I have tried it a couple times since then, and it's the same thing. It's the same reoccurring thought every time. And I'm so scared that like, I am going to harm myself. And so I say all of this because like, I want to try psychedelics so bad. I've had multiple people tell me like that could help with your trauma. But since I've had such a bad experience with cannabis and I know they're totally different, I get so scared. Well, you should be scared. Yeah. <laughs> Everything that you're saying is correct. So first and foremost, there's contraindications to psychedelics. And you just mentioned some of them. Bipolar is a contraindication. You know, what's psychosis. that? What's contraindication? Contraindication means you're not supposed to do it. Contraindication means you're not supposed to do it. So contraindication, like for massage therapy, you know, um, if you're giving a pregnant woman a massage, you're not supposed to massage her ankles because an ankle can induce labor, right? Okay. So you don't okay. massage the ankles. So if someone has bipolar or schizophrenia, they're not supposed to be taking psychedelics. It's contraindicated. So, so the reason that psychedelics medicine is a new emerging field is because you work with a doctor or a therapist who does a medical intake for you and then tells you whether or not you should do the cannabis okay. and then helps you source cannabis that's appropriate for you and then supports you through the journey and then the integration afterwards where you integrate the experience and whatever insights you had or whatever you know, negative experiences you had. So the idea is that it's held in the context of medicine, right? Not mm. that you try it because you've heard psychedelics might be helpful. That's not what third wave recommends. It's not mm -hmm. what I recommend. It's not, that's not a therapeutic use of psychedelics. That's people experimenting. And, right. <laughs> and that's part of the problem that happened the first time is a lot of people were doing a lot of things. They were mixing different substances together they were trying things that were not good for their mind or their body. And that's where we went awry last time. And that's why yeah. we had all the problems we had last time. And so we're trying to avoid that this time. And we're trying to say, these are the best practices. You need to do a medical history with someone before you try these things. And you need to have that medical support while you're doing it. So psychedelics may be completely off the table for you. I'm not a medical professional. Right but we have a directory and there's over 200 people in the directory. You would contact someone in the directory with this expertise. You would do a medical intake with them and then they would make recommendations for you. And they might tell you, Melissa, psychedelics are off the table for you. They're off the table. And that's, that's good to know, right? Because some people are allergic <laughs> to peanuts and they're not uh -huh. to peanuts. Like, yep. You know, and you can't be like, well, I keep trying peanuts and I keep having allergies to peanuts. Well, you're not supposed to be eating the peanuts. So yeah, that's an important part of this process is really figuring out whether or not you should be doing it to begin with. So it might be that these medicines are not appropriate for you. It doesn't mean that a whole range of uh, homeopathy or herbalism or other things are not available to you. You know, that's one of the reasons why I did the herbalism course, because mm -hmm there are thousands of flowers and botanical remedies for everything from allergies to menstrual cramps, to headaches, to insomnia. I mean, so there could be plants that uh, are really good for your body if, if psychedelics are not a good fit for you. So yeah, yeah that's important for sure. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that. And I also want to share my story because when I, when I first tell people about my, um, my experience, first question, oh, it must've been laced. And I'm like, it's not laced. 
other people were smoking it with me. It was from a dispensary. It's not laced, but so many people are unaware that these things can happen. They're just like, oh, just write me off. And that's where I want the education to come from. That's why you, you know, said what you said about the psychedelics and like, we have to go this route now. So we don't mess it up for everybody like we did <laughs> back in the fifties. Um, but that's why I tell my story because I want people to take care of themselves in the right way. And I'm telling you, it's the most ex scariest experience of my entire life. I am, but it makes me sad. It makes me sad that like, I don't want to say that I can never, but like you said, you have to educate yourself on what. Yeah. There might be things. protocols that are appropriate for you. You mm -hmm. know, that's why you work with a professional. You tell them what you want to work on and, and you, and you might start with microdoses and see how the microdoses affect you first. Yeah. That's why it's important to have, to have that support. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you very much <laughs> for sharing that. Cause I definitely wanted to talk about um, that a little bit. Um, I'm looking at some of my notes and I also wanted to ask you, you wrote about travel immersions and I'm not exactly sure what that is. So, so what are tra travel immersions? Yeah. Living and working in different places. So I had met, I mentioned like that I lived with a medicine woman in New Mexico, right? I was on her property for a few months and we were doing all kinds of farming and permaculture and cultivating peyote and preparing that for ceremonies. I was in Guatemala for two months living and working with different healers and studying different things. So that's one way that I like to learn is to go somewhere and immerse myself in the environment, in the culture, and have that really full experience. Mm -hmm. And I've been to about 50 countries now, and I've lived all over the United States, and I've lived abroad. And it's just one of the ways that I learn and grow and transform is by going back to the I've been to India, I've been to Tibet, I've been to Machu Picchu, I've been to, you know, these places. And I feel like it's really been a valuable experience for my own learning and my own transformation. And I included some of that in the book. And I included some of that in my dissertation research as well. Yeah, it's I like look at you and I'm like, this woman has accomplished so much in her life. Like, this is incredible to me. So when you said like, whenever you were coming out with your book, you know, you were scared to see how the world would perceive it. And it's just like, but then again, it, it's weird because I'm like, how, what, why would anybody say anything? Like you are a total badass. Like why would, but that, I guess the point I'm trying to make is we all have our like stuff, like no matter how long the accomplishment list is or the bank account money is we all have, I guess, our, our yeah, stuff. Yeah, I would that say still... it's been a work in progress to have that self-esteem. My friend said the same thing to me, like, you're a badass. You need to own that. You need to, you know, recognize that, appreciate that about yourself. I also think there has been a very real um, oppression and attack on on people for a very long time. I mean, it started in the Middle Ages. I wrote about this in, in my dissertation about the the witch hunts against women. That was actually a very real thing. Up to a million women were killed for practicing holistic modalities that I practice right now. Um, and I think there's been a continued repression and suppression of mental health uh, over the years. And a lot of these topics, they were forbidden to talk about. I, I have a friend actually that's a lawyer and, and revealed at his law firm that he was struggling with some mental health issues, but that he was in therapy and it was being taken care of. And they've slowly been taking cases away from him and pushing him out of the organization. Is that illegal? Yes, it's illegal. But it all started with his disclosure and, and disclosure can still have this ripple effect even now even though it's illegal it can still have a ripple effect and i talk about my own mental health struggles in the book and luckily i work in a field that embraces those but if i had been an attorney or something right now and this book had come out could it 
jeopardize my career. I mean, I'm seeing that play out with a friend right now. Will he fight it? Will he sue them? Will it be a whole thing? Maybe, but who wants to fight that fight to tell their personal story? You know, that's a, that's a difficult choice to make. So I think there was, some of it was my own insecurities, but I do think culturally we still haven't gotten to the place where there is that universal acceptance that this is okay and it happens and we just need, you know, resources and support to get through it. So, yeah. That's really like the story of your friend. That's really, really sad. Like, I mean, that's what so many people are faced with. They, they struggle first with themselves, with their truth. And then when they finally have the courage to come out, they aren't necessarily embraced with open arms from either their peers, society, employers, whatever. And like, that's, that's really, really sad. And we still have such a long way to go. And I hope, I hope your friend has like a positive outcome and like, maybe his story will be an example, you know, that work still needs to be done for this because there's still so many people that just look at mental health as if you can't still be capable of doing your job or this, that, and the other. And it's, it, I don't know. We just have a long way to go, but we've also made progress. I That's totally right. agree with you. Yeah. I try to be hopeful. I try to be hopeful. Totally well, agree. <laughs> before before we end today's session, is there anything else that we kind of missed? I know we've talked on a lot of different topics, but is there anything else that you would like to discuss or you um, want to leave like a, I was going to put it, say a lasting message. That's not what I meant, but like <laughs> leave my listeners with, um, if there's anything that we didn't talk about, I guess I'm trying to say we can talk about it now. <laughs> I would say that the lasting message is to tell your own story, tell it to yourself, tell it to people that you trust. I think that among all the therapeutic modalities, writing is one of the most powerful, storytelling is one of the most powerful. And that was one of my intentions for the book. It wasn't to become some book celebrity. It was to create an impact, a positive impact, and to encourage other people to also reflect and express their own experience. And so, yeah, I would invite you to do that. You know, I'm available on social media and email in different places if you want to reach out. Um, but get together with friends, have a conversation, talk to each other. I want this book to connect you to yourself and to other people. I can't wait to read it. Not, I'm literally, I, I did not realize that Holly sent me a PDF copy and I emailed her today asking for a real copy. Cause I didn't know. And I'm like, Oh my God, I feel like a jackass now, but I, oh, have, I have it and I'm going to like, I'm going to like sit on my bed and, and read it. But, um, speaking of that, what is the name of your book again and where can people find it? Yeah, it's called All This Healing Is Killing Me. It's on Amazon in digital paperback and audio. So you can get any version that you like. And then my website is just my name, Gabriel Polici, which is hard to spell, but it's probably in the show notes. So <laughs> yes, it is. And then I'm Dr. Gabby Polici and all the social channels. Uh, so yeah, let me know if you liked it. Let me know thoughts and feelings Perfect. and yeah, I'm happy to connect with the listeners. Awesome. Well, thank you. Well, Dr. Gabby, I ask all of my guests this one last question before we leave. In your own words, what does the bright side of life mean to you? To me, it means always striving for the light. When I say the light, it's like what uplifts you? What brings you joy? What inspires you? What gives you fulfillment? And to be in pursuit of that while also allowing yourself to be human and allowing yourself to make mistakes and not rejecting any parts of the journey. There's a really beautiful roomy poem that comes to mind called The Guest House. I don't know if you're familiar with that oh, one. Not. Yeah. And um, you might want to look it up, but it's like allowing anything to sweep through your house and embracing it no matter no matter what it is. I really think when we do that, we invite more light and we can hold more light. Yep. Absolutely. I'm going to have to read that. Um, the poem. It. It's yes. really cool. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on here to share everything that we talked about. This has been such a pleasure and I can't wait to read your book. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks for having me. 
You are so welcome. 